So I did have an improv idea that we could actually have two ideas that we could. Are you freaking serious right now? Are you freaking serious right now? Hi, it's Mike with Behavioral Comedy, and today I'm here to talk to you about functional communication training. A few things before we really jump into the meat and potatoes, I would like you to understand why is it called functioning? I keep saying this over and over again in the videos. Things are called by what they do or someone's last name. So all behaviors have a function, meaning all behaviors have a reason. All behaviors occur for to, to do something, and that's the function. You think about what's the function of a car? To drive someone places. What's the function of a whiteboard? So you can write on it. It's what it's for. It's what it does. Behavior is the same way. All behaviors have a function. Sometimes it's really hard to find out. Sometimes it's very obvious. But with functional communication training, you need to take whatever behavior you're, you're trying to modify. It's usually going to be a problematic behavior. And we need to find or determine the function of that behavior and then replace it with the more socially appropriate behavior that serves the same function. So how do you determine the function of that behavior? Well, there's something in our field we call MOs, or motivating operations. And all that really means is you're motivated to do something. And so when you have motivation, Whatever you're motivated by, that is now going to serve as a reinforcer. Whatever behaviors have accessed that reinforcer in the past are now more likely to occur. So what you really are trying to do is you're trying to find out what is that motivation. And then whatever you're motivated by, you try to use that for the replacement behavior. And that whole process, and we'll get down to it in a minute, is really functional communication training. So you need to know the function of the behavior. That's where a BCBA would come in, and they either run a functional behavior assessment or a functional analysis, and they can say, this maladaptive behavior, let's say it's screaming, ah, ah, we would determine, or the BCBA would come in and determine the function of that behavior. We then say the reason that the learner screams is so that they can get cookies. So what do we do? We come in and we give a more appropriate or a socially significant replacement behavior so that way that learner can disengage in that behavior and get access to cookies. And in that way, everyone's happy. The problem that some people have, if you're motivated to get cookies, you're gonna do what gets you cookies. And so the learner that I'm making up right now, their screaming gets them cookies. So you need to come up with a way, a better way, a more socially significant way to get cookies. And that's really what functional communication is. Why do we call it communication? Because it involves someone else. You have to communicate through that other individual, usually a parent, a therapist, a grandparent, a teacher, whoever, a babysitter, whoever's in that environment, whoever, whoever's giving the cookie. You need to communicate to that person, I want a cookie. Currently, this fictional student is screaming to get access to cookies. So what we do is we train a new behavior that will communicate to that adult in a functional way to get a cookie. So as I stated earlier, all behaviors serve a function. The first step in functional communication training is to find out why does that behavior exist? <laughs> What's going on? Why are you screaming? Why are you throwing toys? Why, are, why is anything happening? You then determine that your BCBA should be able to come in, run some kind of assessment, run some kind of analysis, and say, hey, your child or the learner, whoever we're, we're looking at, whoever we're working with, 
They throw toys to get attention. So the second step that you need to do is you need to find a socially significant and acceptable way to gain access to attention. Because that's the only way throwing toys is going to stop. Because when you're motivated to get attention, you're going to do what works. And in this learner that I'm making up, what works is throwing toys. They throw a toy, and you say, stop throwing toys! Ah, oh, I got my attention. We, we need to stop that. We need, we need to stop it in its tracks. So when you're selecting a replacement behavior, there's a few things you need to keep in, in mind. One, is it going to work all the location that toys are? If so, that's, that's going to be a good start. You want to pick a behavior that that individual can already do. If, if you're working with someone who's non-vocal and does not use you know, spoken language to communicate, you're not going to try to teach them to say a sentence like, look at me over here. I would like your attention, please. It's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. You're going to see more toy throwing to get your attention because that works. So you want to pick something that's in their behavior repertoire or something they can already do. And now you take something they can already do, teach that that that's a functional replacement for throwing toys, and now you engage in that behavior and you get attention. And guess what? There's no more toy throwing. It's awesome. It's great. It's it's. it's Oh, it's amazing. When it works, you just, mm, yes, it's so great. So you also want to pick something. This is a little bit more advanced and it'll be covered in some episode someday, but matching law. So matching law is just a way of saying under what conditions will what behavior occur. And really that in a nutshell, what you need to know for functional communication training is that it's a balance between the effort that the behavior requires and the reward or the reinforcement or the consequence, whatever you get out of it. So I'm not a big jogger. I, I, I don't like to run. I'd rather be on an elliptical. I'd rather ride a bike. But if someone was like, hey, Mike, if you run 10 miles, I'll give you a dollar. No chance. The response effort of running a mile and the reinforcement value of getting a dollar, nope, that behavior is not going to occur. Hey, Mike, we would gi we'll give you $1,000 if you take a step. Well, the, 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 the difficulty in take a step is very easy. The, that response effort is very low. $1,000, that's nice. I would like $1,000. $1, I will take a step for a $1,000. And so really, those are two extremes, and those aren't going to be the situations you're in. But you need to look at that balancing act and find the right level. So when you're trying to find a replacement behavior, a good place to start is, one, something that's already in their repertoire or something they can already do. Two, something that's easier than the problematic behavior. Sometimes I've seen students have, you know, you would just define it as a tantrum, however, however you want to label a tantrum. And it, it looked very hard. Like afterwards, they're winded, sweaty, out of breath. And it was all to get a cookie. So you try to find something that the response effort is easier and the reward is the same. In that way, matching law it's a law, so it's it's going to happen. It's just how behaviorism works. It's just, you know, gravity happens. Matching law happens. If, if two things have the same reward, one's easier than the other, you're going to do the easier thing. So in the toy throwing example, you would want something that's easier than throwing toys. And then they both get the same quality of attention. You might even want to stack the odds in your favor and when they engage in the replacement behavior, you give high quality attention. You give better attention than you would if toy throwing would happen. So you have a learner here 
They have a motivation. They are motivated to get your attention. They throw a few toys, and you say, stop throwing your toys. I'm like, ah, you know, I got a little bit of attention. But if they can, whatever our replacement behavior that we select, whatever they engage in that behavior, oh my goodness, how's it going? Would you like a hug? Let's hang out. You want to read a book together? What, what, what do you want to do? And so you made that behavior easy, low response effort, and then you really increase the value of what's, go of what's going on. And in that way, you're really likely to get that replacement behavior. And hopefully, through if we do this correctly, that problematic behavior is going to go away. When you're selecting a replacement behavior, it might be something as simple as a break card. Or have you ever heard of PECS, Picture Exchange Communication System? I'm not talking about the actual system of using PECS. I'm just talking about the little icons. So picture icons. Um, you know, just touching one of those or exchanging one of those. It could be easier than whatever the problematic behavior is. So if someone's throwing toys, you can just have a card. You touch the card and I'll say, hey, what's going on? Let's hang out. Let's, I'm going to give you the attention that you're motivated to get. And it's easier than throwing the toys. And you give a higher quality attention for touching that card. And now, over repeatedly doing this, doing this over and over and over again, eventually you're going to get that touching card behavior to happen. It's just easier. It's just that's that's what functional communication is. We came up with a way to replace the function of throwing toys, but we didn't replace the function. We found the function of throwing toys, and we made it easier to get higher quality attention. And that's really what. I, so let's say we. In the intro, I, I talked about a, uh, a fictional student who was screaming to get cookies. So if they scream and scream and scream, which hurts your throat, it's not fun. You know, I, I think the response effort of screaming is high. So you come up with something simple like saying K or, or just saying cookie or point or a, a card that looks like a cookie. You hand that to someone or you touch it on the wall or right in front of the cookie jar. There's, there's an icon of a cookie. You touch the cookie. Then you make it easier, and then you get two, three cookies. Oh, that's a lot of cookies. Well, also think about stuff. Let's say you have an individual that screams to get cookies. If you're full on cookies, you're no longer motivated to get the cookies. So that behavior should occur simply from the fact that they got their cookies. Screaming should end with that other individual that I made up, if they're throwing toys to get attention, if they already have your attention, they shouldn't be throwing toys. So if you do see those problematic behaviors or the replacement behaviors, the behaviors we're trying to replace still occur, then you might not be addressing the true function. You need to go back to your assessments. You might really need to do an analysis. You might need to do an extended analysis. You might need to you know, go into the research, find a better way to determine the true function. It also might be multiply maintained, meaning it has more than one function. Well, I scream because I want attention and cookies. So you give a cookie, screaming still happens. You give attention, screaming still happens. But then you give a cookie while going, hey, here's your cookie. Hope you enjoy your cookie. It's chocolate chip. I know that's one of your favorites. Screaming is now gone because you addressed both of the functions. And then you can find a replacement behavior for that. And sometimes the learner, you, you can't find anything that will work that's already in their repertoire. Something they can already do. So what I've done before, I've literally had a card that said the name of what we wanted. Let's just use, we'll use the cookie example. I have a card that says cookie. You see some of those behaviors that, ooh, we're about to get screaming so they can get a cookie. That's about to happen. Take cookie card and touch their hand and give them a cookie. And they eat the cookie. Touch cookie card. Their hand, give them a cookie. 
they eat the cookie. Now you bring the cookie card right in front of their hand. And now they got to move their hand a little bit. They touch the card, they get a cookie. Do that a few times. Then you get to the point it's a foot away. You get to the point you're no longer holding it, but it's just sitting on the table. And eventually what you get is to, you can get to a point where the end goal is you now have a cookie icon or that, that card that we're using that says cookie, and it's like two rooms away or it's upstairs or downstairs. It's far away. And the individual goes, hey, I got a really good way of getting cookies. If I go touch that card, if someone sees me, if I can communicate that I want a cookie to someone else by touching this card, then I'll, I'll get a cookie. So then you go find the card, you bring it to someone, you go, oh, thanks for telling me you want a cookie, let's go get one. That's how it works. So then we... Hey, how's it, how's it going? Other things that are really important, how long between engaging in that new behavior and getting the cookie? As soon as you touch the break card, boom! They even did a parametric analysis. Oh, is it parametric? I think so. I'm going to have to look that up after this. But they did an analysis and they found out that they waited one second and gave the reward or reinforcer, and they waited 20 seconds and delivered the same thing. One second, much more effective than 20 seconds. Things like that. One se yeah, one second. So, so you think, oh, 20 seconds? That's not even, that's a third of a minute. 20 seconds is too long. The immediacy of reinforcement is so powerful that I, I, it can't be underestimated. One second beats 20 seconds. Half a second beats one second. But the quicker, the sooner you can do it. So if you're in the middle of doing functional communication training and your learner comes up to you and gives you a card, don't say, oh, in a minute. If, you're, if that's the program you're running, as soon as they give you that cookie card, you give them a cookie. In fact, if I'm doing the training, I have cookies hidden right next to me. So that way when I was like, cookie, boom, here's a cookie. Immediately, immediately, you stop everything you're doing because we're trying to teach you a new way to communicate. And that's how you do it. If you're not going to do that, if you're going to teach them to wait or other things like that, you're either farther down the line and you're trying to teach more advanced skills, you're trying to teach accepting no, waiting, things of that sort. But when you're starting off functional communication training, it's every time, every time they touch the cookie card, give them a cookie immediately. Carry cookies with you. If you're like a parent at home, have like an apron or like what waiters wear and just carry cookies on you. And every single time they do that, give them a cookie. Cookie. Every time. Give them a cookie. Give them a cookie. Have cards. Have cookie cards all over the house. So no matter where you're at, there's a cookie card here. There's a cookie card there. 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 Everywhere. Everywhere's cookie cards. And you say, like, sometimes you do parent training. Parents just don't get it. And they'll be like, well, I don't want cookie cards all over my house. Then your child's going to scream. Would you, you got to now make a decision. What's more valuable to you? Having cookie cards all over your house? Or I guess not having cookie cards all over your house? Or having your child scream? I've also had parents say, well, I'm only going to give them three cookies a day. Okay, well, it'll work for three cookies. But after those three cookies, expect screaming to occur. If they're motivated to get a cookie, they're going to do things that have given them cookies in the past. In the example we made up, screaming is how you get cookies. So if they appropriately ask for a cookie and you don't give them a cookie, they're going to go back to what's real, that's worked before. Oh, that card is broken. I'm going to go back to screaming. Oh, my child's still screaming. Are you running the program? Absolutely, we're running the program. And then at the BCBA, you got to come in there. You're almost like a detective trying to Sherlock Holmes it. Like, got a little magnifying glass. What's going on here? Why isn't that working? What's going on? And then at the end of the day, like, well, I'm not going to give him a fourth cookie. Oh, I wish you would have told me that right away because the program's not going to work. We wasted everyone's time because it's not going to work. They're going to go back to screaming because you refuse to give them four cookies. Well, what about the health effects of cookies? And that? you got to make decisions. And we're not going to end there. We're not going to. Functional communication training doesn't end. 
with your house covered in cookie carts. With every single time you ask for a cookie, you get one immediately. It ends with, can I have a cookie? You have one card somewhere hidden in the house, like in a designated area, or they just carry all their cards on their pocket. I've seen someone with a necklace had a stack like this thick of just a bunch of picture icons. And they would find the one they wanted and they would touch it and look at you. And then you might say, wait. You might even say, you can't get that until tomorrow. You know, what happens if a student comes up to you and gives you a picture of their grandmother? Grandma's not coming till Friday, and it's Tuesday. You have to wait. That's just a part of life. And a functional communication will eventually get there. It'll eventually get to a point where in the natural environment, meaning at school, at Walmart, at, at, at Toys R Us, uh, it doesn't even exist anymore, um, wherever, wherever you're at, it'll work. That's the end goal, to be independent, to be able to ask for a cookie anywhere in the world and then wait until cookies are available without going back to that maladaptive behavior. But if you're motivated enough for cookies and you can't wait because it hasn't been systematically increased and that, that schedule density hasn't been thin to a point that is maintained in the natural environment, you're going to get screaming for cookies. It's going to happen. You see it walking through the grocery store. You see, I want a candy bar. I want a candy bar. I want a candy bar. It, they haven't learned that to accept wait or accept no. And so when you see something like that, you're just like, hmm, I don't know. But I have a suspicion that if I ran a functional assessment or a functional analysis, we would determine that that behavior has, has some function and it works in their day-to-day -day life. And now they're engaging in that behavior because the alternatives that they tried are not working. And so your BCBA should write a plan that starts with every time cookie cards everywhere. And it ends with, um, you got to go, I don't know where your cookie card is, go find it. And then they give you a cookie card and you say, after dinner, you can have one cookie. That's, you know, whatever is acceptable in that learner's life. It might be, you don't get a cookie until tomorrow. You get cookies every other day. We, get, we eat cookies on Friday. That's the only time we eat cookies. We eat cookies on Friday. You need to wait for Friday. Well, it's Saturday and I want a cookie. It, once that happens, you're good. That has been trained. We, my uncle also volunteers at this place that has retired people from Hollywood. Hey, um, I'm going to have to go. I can email you before I go to bed. Thanks. Okay. Another really important thing about functional communication training is you need to now stop giving that reward or that reinforcer for the problematic behavior. If that child starts screaming, you don't get cookies. And they might scream and scream and scream and scream. It's called extinction. If you ever hear your BCBA saying, we're putting that behavior on extinction. One thing I got to cost you, anytime you put something on extinction, just a part of science, when I drop this, it falls. A part of extinction, when you start that, it's going to get worse before it gets better. An example, I didn't make this up, but an example I really like, when you look for your keys in your purse. Usually you put your hand in your purse, you pull out your keys, right? You put in your hand in your purse, you don't find your keys, you didn't get a reward. So what do you do? You move stuff around, you start taking stuff out, it ends with dumping the bag out. And after you've dumped the bag out and you've done it as big as you can, I've, I've exploded, we call it an extinction burst. I burst it. I burst it all over the place. My behavior was just bursting out. You give up and you try something else. You go look in the couch cushions. You go look in your jacket pocket. You go look in your other purse. You look, you look wherever. You do other, other times I found my keys are in these areas. And so that's what we try to do. The child that's throwing toys. Maybe they throw one or two toys and usually say, stop throwing toys. Now we have a replacement. I have a card. You can even have a card attached to you. They come up and they touch the card and they get attention. Or you teach them to tap you. Or they point at you. Or you got an attention card over there. Or you teach them to say, look at me. Or look. Or attention. Anything. Whatever, whatever that replacement behavior is, they engage in it. Um, and they get attention. That's their replacement behavior. But now they throw toys again. 
They're going to throw one toy. They throw two toys. For whatever reason, they don't engage in the replacement behavior. And now, they kind of look at you. You, you can't give attention. You need to turn that behavior off. You need, that doesn't function for attention anymore. Cut it off. Cut off the function. It doesn't work. Like in a shower, what's the point, what's the function of a shower? To get water to come off and then drain. Cut the water off, you quit going in the shower. But every once in a while, you might go and turn the knob to see if it still works. Maybe you really just can't find your keys. You look in the couch cushion, you looked in your coat pocket. You go back to the purse. Oh, did I just miss it in the purse? And you try again. So your learner is going to scream for cookies again. It's going to happen. Your learner's going to throw toys again. It's going to happen. It doesn't just, it's not a light switch. You turn on and off. But what you need to do is you need to withhold whatever they're motivated to get and then prompt them and encourage them to engage in the appropriate behavior that we're training so that they can communicate what they want in a safe and healthy way. And like I said, they're going to do it worse. They usually throw two toys. Now they've thrown four, five. Then we even dunk over the whole toy bucket. Not going to tell them to not throw toys. Not going to do it. And you, you want to so bad. Because in your repertoire, it's reinforced. Because if you say, stop throwing toys, throwing toys stops. But it's almost like a catch-22. Because you said stop throwing toys, to toy throwing stopped. But since you say quit throwing toys, that's why they throw the toys the next time. So in that moment, absolutely it's easier to get them to quit throwing toys by saying don't throw toys. Really easy, very easy. Say don't throw toys, it stops, it goes away. But tomorrow, they're going to throw toys. The day after, they're going to throw toys. The day after that, they're going to throw toys. So what you need to do is it's going to be hard up front. It's tough. It's not easy. They're throwing, and you're, and you're sitting there saying, I can make this stop. I could make this stop right away. Right away, in a very easy way, I can make this stop. And then that's what you have to determine for yourself with like matching law. What's more valuable to you? The response effort of not saying that, that's high. It's, it's really hard to watch a kid just destroy a room and you know that you can make it end right away. But what is that value? What is valuable to you? In the long run, toys are no longer thrown. Or do you want toys to be quit getting thrown today, but every day for the rest of their life we have toy throwing behavior? And now you got a 60 year old individual living at home or living in a group home that throws toys or throws items. It's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this um this this older individual is throwing toys well it's because their entire life every time they threw a toy someone said quit throwing a toy so you gotta stop that you gotta turn it off turn that off and now they throw toys you just, nope nope not even gonna look at you not even gonna look at you no attention no attention and you might take that break card or you might take the attention card whatever let's say we're using a card for this individual you just hold it up hold it up and point it out to them not going to say anything. You don't, you don't say I'm not going to say anything. I've literally had someone go, I'm ignoring you right now. You're ignored. You? I am ignoring this. And I was like, oh, you haven't even started ignoring. Haven't even started ignoring. No, ignoring is, you got this card, you might even shake it. You might even shake it. You know, and that's why I said eventually you might have to go up and like tap that card on their hand. Hey, how's it going? Th thanks for hanging out. Like, what? I destroyed this room. I destroyed this room and you didn't say anything. You tap this card against my hand and you tell me good job and you love me? Next time they're destroying the room, it's a lot of effort. My arms hurt. Oh, destroying the room isn't easy. Boom, they tap my card. Then maybe next time you, then you're holding it out. You're like at step two, step three of functional communication training. You hold that card out. You know what? It's not easy to dump over my toy chest. And sometimes I have to pick it up. Side note, you should pick it up every time. If, if, you know, if you can do, you know, get that individual to pick that up, whole different topic. But, you know, it's, it's a lot of work to dump over that toy chest. And they keep on holding that card out. Maybe I want to walk over and point that card. They touch the card as soon as they touch. You look, peripheral your eyes. You look, or you feel the card. 
Oh, boom. Hey, thank you for telling me what's going on. Oh, hugs, kisses, whatever they're looking for, whatever they're motivated to get. Mm -hmm. As soon as I touch it, cookies. You want cookies? Immediately. And remember, you can't, so you can't be like, well, we're going to clean up our toys, then I'll tell you a good job. You know, clean up or, or hey, um, we'll get cookies after dinner. Nope, you're going to get that problematic behavior again. Eventually, we're going to get there. And I've had parents. I know it's tough. Well, I'm, I, we're about to eat dinner. We can't eat a bunch of cookies before dinner. Well, then they're going to scream for cookies for the rest of their lives. So some days, we're going to eat cookies for dinner. It sucks. It's not healthy. That's not what we want. But in the long run, that's what it's going to take. Still offer dinner. Still try to get them to eat dinner. Still give them dinner. Try to encourage them too. But when you're in the beginning phase, it's a functional communication training. There's nothing. Like when I set up contingencies, when I set up a system, someone could fall down from the heavens and go, Mr. Mike, I want you to stop giving them cookies. I was like, oh, not until phase three. At phase three, that's when we're not going to honor that. But until then, every time they touch that card, they're getting a cookie. Also, do not set yourself up for failure. If we're using the cookie example, you should have, I don't know, 10,000 cookies at your house. And when you get to 5,000, you go buy more. You don't want to run out of cookies. Because what's going to happen? You're going to get screaming. But also in those moments, they start screaming for cookies. Nope, no cookies. No cookies. And that's up to your behavior analyst. Maybe sometimes in those moments, even if you're screaming and touch the card, you get the cookie. Sometimes maybe you have to wait until you quit screaming, then touch the card and get the cookie. That really depends on safety, harm. Is it better to wait until screaming stops? Absolutely. But maybe you're working with someone who punches themselves in the face. And so you come up, you tap their card, and you give them a cookie, even while they're punching themselves in the face. They're already getting cookies for punching themselves in the face, so you're not, you're not really changing anything there. Now you're just giving an easier way. And they're just like, you know, I punch myself, I punch myself, I punch myself, I get tapped with a card, and I get a cookie. And then over time, over and over again, <laughs> I worked with a kid that would headbang, and it, I mean, it was like scary. Like scared, like I begged the family to like get a helmet. Part of their part of their problem was like, well, now now they they kind of have a weapon. I was like, safety first. You need safety first. We had mats, pillows, everything. I use this functional communication training. We were using um, picture icons, you know, like pecs. Uh, we weren't using the phases of pecs. Side note: to really use all the phases of pecs is really complicated. You can't even get to like phase two or three until or to, to implement it by yourself until phase two or three. Like you need multiple people if you're doing pecs. A lot of people say they're doing pecs. No, they're just using picture icons. They use the cards, but they're not doing pecs. Like that's a whole system. Um, so just like functional communication training, people might not, people might use break cards, but they're not using FCT. You know, so it's, it's really a process. And pecs is a process. Just, just so I, I digress. But that, that individual just headbang, headbang, headbang. And I was like, whatever, whatever. What, you know, we did, an, we did a FBA. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't need an FA. We found out this is the function of headbanging. And it was good access to uh, some kind of treat. I can't remember what treat it was. So, some edible. Um, had them. Very reliable. Month after month after month. Doing it, doing it. And one day the kid just came up and he just looked confused. And he, he, he put his arms like this, went against the wall, and just gently tapped it. And then he did this whole, his whole cool down process and all that stuff. And I just sat there and I was like, all right, well, you're not, you know, we're not going to get a cookie right away for, for doing that. But sometimes those behaviors just come back. And you just don't, like when you lose your keys, you go back. And you're just like, oh, I swear it's in my purse. Maybe you lose them forever. I've lost keys forever. About once a month for like a year. I'd go check where I thought the keys originally were, because almost every time before that, that's where the keys were. I have a basket in my house, that's where my keys go. 
So I'd go check the basket like once a month. I'm like, I know it's not in there, but you just do it. And so let's say you teach how to get attention appropriately instead of throwing toys. You might get some toy throwing behavior. It's going to happen. You just, you just ignore it. Ignore it. Just ignore it. Then they, they engage in that replacement behavior. Hey, hey, what's going on? Oh, yeah, what's up? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to read you a book. And then later down the phase, you might do, like I said, waiting. Or if they throw toys, they're like, you know what? Now we got to clean this whole room. But I didn't take out the Legos. No, nope. you threw toys, so we're cleaning the entire room. And then I'll read you a book. You know, and that's up to your BCBA. That's up to the system, to the program. What kind of level? How far are you into the functional communication training? But at first, you want it to be like a magic wand. Cookie! Attention! Whatever. Whatever whatever they're motivated to get. I really like the, the improv ideas. Hey, I'm in a meeting right now. Um, we can play after. I, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Can you go ahead? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. So the Just some final thoughts on functional communication training. I want you to remember the immediacy of getting what you're motivated for is so important. The fact that one second is more effective than 20 seconds. You can't wait 20 seconds. That's too long. 10 seconds, you're doing better, but still too long. One second, that's the best you can do. You want it to be as immediately following that target behavior as possible. What are our target behaviors? Whatever's socially acceptable, meaning our society accepts it. So we're not going to teach. Well, why is why why is that individual doing that? Ah, oh, that's how they ask for cookie. No one is going to give anyone a cookie besides the people that directly work with that individual and their immediate family members. You go somewhere else. You go to a grocery store. Oh, can I help you? All right, they're just going to walk away. But, you know, you might learn how to do manual signs. I don't know the sign for cookie, but you do the cookie. And then someone will be like, oh, you're trying to use sign language. Ah, uh, we have someone who works in the deli that knows sign language. You can go, they can go get that individual. Or you can hold up a card that says cookie. They're going to read it. Oh, cookies? That's aisle six. You know, so you're going to find something that works in their environment, works in the places they're going to go. It's going to be easier than our problem behavior, at least at first. So an individual that can use vocal communication, you know, someone who uses the spoken language to communicate, it might start with cookie or k k I'm just going to say k. If you say k, you get a cookie. And then it's going to end with, excuse me, Mr. Mike. Can I please have a cookie? You know, that's eventually what we're going to look for. But you start with the k, and you end with, excuse me, Mr. Mike, can I please have a cookie? And the problem I've seen functional communication go, go wrong is that you don't follow the steps. You get too anxious. Or you're just like, you know, I just, I just need the toy throwing behavior to stop. Well, then for the rest of their life, they're going to throw toys. Do you want today to be good? Or do you want the rest of their life to be good? Do you want the immediate, the immediate, do you want toy throwing behavior to immediately stop? Or do you want it to permanently stop? Because those are not the same two things. And remember, we're going to stop giving that attention after toys are thrown, and simply science says, and I've seen it, anecdotally I've seen it, empirically you can read about it, but it's going to get worse. You're going to go from throwing two toys to maybe destroying the whole room. But you cannot provide attention based on that. you got to only provide attention for the appropriate ways. Some of the best stuff is when the learner comes up with a better way to do it. You know, it's like, say, say, 
They go, cookie? You just said cookie. You just, oh, my, here's a whole box of cookies. You just, you just, you just said cookie. Oh my goodness. Or they have a break card. And you're just like, hey, touch, or not a break card, an attention card. Touch, touch the card and I'll talk to you. And they come and tap on your shoulder. Is that appropriate in our society? Absolutely. So don't sit there and be like, well, the BCBA said I can only provide attention if they touch the card. No, the BCBA just can't make up every single example that exists in our culture. If they do something else that's socially acceptable, honor it. Provide, they come up and say, touch it, or go, <clears throat> or maybe even just look you in the face. Even like, pick up, like I've, had, I've had students, and then they look, hey, what's going on, buddy? They looked at me. They gave me eye contact. They did something that anyone would do in culture, in our culture. You need to provide attention. And then they take that toy and they put it down. And also you might be like, hey, buddy, how's it going? And you quit. As soon as that toy's thrown, quit providing attention. And you also show that's clear, turn on, turn off. If I throw toys, no one talks to me. If I tap them on the shoulder, if I give someone eye contact, if I touch that card, if I wave, if I do this, you know, anything. Anything that's an appropriate way to get attention. So there might be a lot of ways to do it. But you just start with something that's really easy and it's going to work every time. And then you give it to them every time. And then over time, you don't get it as much and you make it delayed, you make it delayed, you make it delayed. Until it's just how everyone responds. You know, as a 30-year-old uh, adult, I don't always get attention when I want it. Sometimes it's hard. You you, you got to deal with it. Um, so you know, sometimes you come up with creative ways to get attention. There's there's all type of things. So that's what you're trying to do. You're just trying to be able to succeed in culture and our society, our society and the environment you live in. So if you can find ways to do that, if you can find the function. Of that problematic behavior find an acceptable way to communicate that hey I have a motivation for this train that up functional communication training it works it's great you won't believe the results it's just hard at first much harder for you as the person running it the person trying to do the programs but that's that's how it is oh, another side note I didn't think about this so sometimes, like, when I talk to families, they're like, Mike, I can't just give cookies all day. Well, it's not that I don't want to give cookies. It's just I have to make dinner or I have to do laundry or for whatever reason, I can't give cookies all day. Well, if you scream to get cookies, what's something that's going to stop you from screaming to get cookies? Having all the cookies. Just give them, like, hey, I got to go do laundry. Here's 100 cookies. I'm, I'm exaggerating, you know, but here's a pack of cookies. They're going to eat five or six, get sick. They're like, oh, all right, I'm done eating cookies. And now they're not going to scream to get cookies because they just had a bunch of cookies. Or if you want to give attention. So if you have an individual who really throws, all right, let's go back to the example, throws toys to get attention. And you have to do so. I got to make a phone call. I can't do it during the phone call. I can't give attention during the phone call. This is a really important phone call. I have to take it. You know what you do beforehand? You give a lot of attention. Like maybe for like an hour. And you, I kind of look for eventually the learner is going to be like, all right, like I've had enough of you. Will you leave me alone for a little bit? And you go, absolutely. I'm going to go make my phone call. You just give a bunch of attention, a bunch of high quality attention, 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 attention. And eventually oh, I'm no, I'm no longer motivated for attention. If you can address that motivation, they're not going to engage in that behavior that is due to the motivation. You got rid of it. You don't eat food when you're full. So if you had someone that engaged in problematic behaviors to get food, just stuff them. Just fill them up. Give them all the food. Until like, oh, I can't have another bite. All right, well, I'm gone. You're, I, now I got like a half an hour before you're hungry again. 
Oh, P.S. There's a, a plate of nachos on the counter or whatever. Eat those if you get hungry. Boom. Now you can go do the laundry or whatever you got to do or, or make a phone call or, or, or cut your hair or what, whatever. Whatever you got to do, now you can do it because that behavior should not occur because they're no longer motivated for it. So those are little tricks you can do that if you can't do the functional communication training. And sometimes the behavior analysts, we're just so focused on those like session hours that we forget as the family unit so hard to do it all day. You can't, you can't do it from wake up, from sun up to sundown, can't. It's so exhausting, absolutely exhausting. But you can set up the times. We're gonna do it from this time to this time. In between then, you just get all the cookies you want. Get all the cookies you want until now, and you get all your cookies after that. But in between, if you want a cookie, you gotta come give me this card. And talk with your BCBA and find a way that you can set those times up. So, hope this was informative. I hope it helped. If something wasn't clear, please email me, behavioralcomedy.com. No, behavioralcomedy at gmail.com. Let me know. Uh, drop me a line. If you like the videos, you want to see more, you can subscribe, uh, like, uh, hit the buttons. There's buttons all over the place. I'm told they help. I haven't noticed they helped, but everyone at the end, that's what you're supposed to say at the end of videos, right? I'm just following rules. It, it, my, that behavior has not been reinforced and selected in my, my repertoire. I just, I'm copying what everyone else does. Imitation. So, yeah, let me know. Let me know what you liked, what you didn't like. How can I make this better? And that's it. So stay safe out there and 